So just want to make sure I was sharing a screen. I had to do some reconfiguring. So I have some notes over here on another computer. Uh, but good morning. And thank you so much, you guys, for joining me here today. I am going to just minimize my screen right here and move this up a little bit. Let's see if I can change my view. Okay. No, I want to minimize it all the way. Okay, great. So can everybody see the PowerPoint? We're clear? Cool. So my name's Khadija. I am a licensed clinical social worker right here in Richmond, Virginia. I am the owner and founder of Real Healing Center, where I offer um, clinical supervision, training, and education around um, for clinicians, for social workers. Um, also do have been doing work with the Department of Behavioral Health, um, and in terms of clinical consultation and supervision. So today, I just wanted to start conversations around uh, working in substance use uh, disorder with youth and adolescents with navigating a cultural bias, navigating cultural bias and disparity uh, with adolescents and young adults. Um, I also do quite a bit of work with the navigating all levels of care for adolescents and adults. And I think it's it, it kind of struck me that this was a really important conversation because I supervise, you know, people from all diverse backgrounds. And a question came up for one of the supervisees around navigating with the family of a child that was in school. And she was really, you know, having a lot of difficulty and struggling around this idea that the parent wasn't really talking with her and engaged with her. Um, wasn't really engaged in care. And so a lot of that, a lot of those times where we're talking about engagement, we're really talking about a relationship, right? That has to be fostered and has to be nurtured. And some some ways when we started really moving through that space was, you know, her her own understanding. And I just flat out asked, you know, do you have an understanding about where this family comes from? Right? Do we have an understanding about the culture and the family and you know, what their boundaries are, what their needs are. And um, she was a non-Black supervisee. And she said, well, no, I don't have a, anything specific. I know that I'm not discriminating or practicing any, you know, discrimination, racism, things like that, which is often times the case, right? Is that sometimes people really, uh, you know, sometimes bias can be implicit and sometimes bias can be very obvious. Um, but in this case, she was, you know, pretty clear that she was not approaching this child or this client in ways that felt um, inauthentic to her or inauthentic to this experience. So um, real, right, just the word real is from my book, Real, it stands for Radical Empathic Acceptance of Life. It is still a book you can get on Amazon. And I actually talk about this book was released in 2020. And I talk about the experience of growing up in a family with substance use disorder. Uh, my older sister um, uh, was dealing with substance use in her teenage years. And for many years, as she became a mom to uh, about seven children, five of them went to the foster care system. And um, two of them, she actually raised herself. Um, she is you know, in recovery now and doing well, um, living in another state. And I, I take the approach of approaching that relationship that I have with her and also with my entire family members around trauma, right? And all the experiences that we have. And I always want to be clear, my sister, you know, acted out in a way with substance use, but all of us, and I'm the youngest of seven, acted out in other ways, right? We just expressed our trauma in different ways. And that's one of the ways that we we come to know and appreciate that really at the underpinnings of all this treatment, oftentimes is trauma in our lived experience. So without further ado, just kind of wanted to walk through some of the expectations, right? And in this training, I do want you to try on some new things. Um, maybe some new words, 
There may be some feelings of discomfort whenever we talk about culture and race and oppression. And just know that this is a safe and supportive space that you're able to, will stop at points and, and ask, are there any questions? Um, are there any clarifications? Are there any, any things that you'd like to share? Any appreciations? Um, all of those things are welcome. We won't be um, sticking with things that are like politically correctness and using pre precise language, right? Or the like diversity, what I call like diversity language. Really, this is really meant for us to move beyond language, right? Into empathy. Because sometimes we get so caught up in saying the right thing and presenting the right ways. But when we really think about it, we all have some genuine human connection, right? And it's it's our job to be aware, right? It's our job to be aware of the culture. It's our job. And it's not that we're going to know every single culture. It's to be aware of our own, right? It's to be aware of our own privilege. It's to be aware of our own bias. Um, and even just the reaction and the emotions and feelings of feeling like other, right? And I think everyone has experienced a, a moment where they felt othered, right? Um, or not enoughness. And that has a lot to do with how we talk about oppression, right? And how we break that down. So some of our expectations is just really to try on, right? We want to really talk from a self-focused place. Um, we want to go beyond language, really make this about stories about you, what you felt, what you experienced, what you struggle with, right? And I don't know a person who hasn't struggled, right? Uh, even talking to uh, MSW students, they're saying things like, how do we, you know, work past bias and oppression? And I said, I don't think that you can work past it. I think you become more aware of it. And that's the way that I approach all of the, the cultural experiences and the, what I'm learning and the, what I'm experiencing. Um, so some of the learning objectives, right, is going to be to start looking at some of the substance use disorder assessments and treatment from a cultural affirmative lens. So you may notice things that I'll say as far as being affirmative in that there have been parts of our culture, especially African-American culture, where it's been taught that certain aspects are negative and they're actually impacting um, substance use or mental health in a negative way. And what I found is a lot of those um, core strengths, ancestral beliefs, and um, indigenous, right, ways of being are, are oftentimes our biggest strength. Um, but when you don't understand, right, when you're coming from outside of the culture and you don't understand how those things interplay and how those things work, it can really be challenging. It can really cause for a lot of disruption in terms of engagement, in terms of a relationship, um, you know, with our clients. Um, we're also going to challenge some oppression-based models. Now, people will say, well, it's an oppression-based model, right? Anything that's not culturally affirmative. Um, you ha we have to come from an understanding that a lot of the psychology, the mental health, and the medical field was created from a very Eurocentric model. And really, it really took away from and negated a lot of the indigenous and other cultural ways that have been practiced and celebrated and modes of healing for, for, for many, many years. And in fact, some of that is still in our healthcare system. Some of those barriers are still there. Some of those automatic and like I said, implicit ways of being are still very much um, a part of our clinical work. And we can't ignore that those things still uh, exist. And that is why so many of us really need great supervision and clinical consultation because they do come up and they come up pretty often. Um, this individual I was clinician I was telling you about, although she was she's not black, um, she did work in a school that was predominantly black, and she worked predominantly with black boys. And some of the themes around discipline and um, you know what her expectations of family were going to be and how she was choosing to join with family and, and was she being clear about those things really showed through with some of the, the modeling, right? That she had been taught in the MS, same MSW program that I came from at VCU and same other schools of, of social work and um, of healthcare, right? That this is what families are supposed to be doing to respond. 
And this is the way. And oftentimes the way is from another culture, from other. So we really want to promote those strength-based modalities, that collective inclusivity, as, as we call it, um, finding ways to really kind of do more exploration around what is the proper fit for the individual um, without taking them out of their just like natural, healthy, uh, indigenous, right, way of being. Um, so one of the ways that I like to approach navigating bias is to really heighten awareness of bias. You know, oftentimes, especially people outside of a culture will say, well, I never notice, right, discrimination. I never notice prejudice. The major huge things that come up for them are oftentimes like the, the overt racism, right? Um, lynchings and um, maybe police brutality incidents on TV, maybe Ku Klux Klan or, you know, some political affiliation. It has to be really broad and really what we call overt. But what we learned is, is how detrimental it is to start heightening our awareness around those things that we really walk past every day. One of the things I wanted to just point to was just the, the because um, again, we, we definitely want to be like based in the their evidence, right? Because oftentimes that's what people will say. Well, I, I didn't notice it, but there's things that are around us every day we just don't notice, right? Are we aware that like one in five Black households are situated in a food desert. And although that may not seem related to substance use at all or mental health at all, food and nutrition, we know, play a huge part, right, in our wellness and our health and our access, right? Just having access to healthy foods and how much it impacts us mentally, right, and physically, having enough food, having a predominance of fresh fruits and vegetables, but to know that of the clients that you're serving, and many of you are working in um, environments that are predominantly um, Black and Brown communities, that just the simplicity of noticing that, that when they go out, right, to get their food or their groceries, it's one in five are impacted by this. Um, and we that that's something that's like current, right? Like we know this is happening right now. Um, the impact of Black farmers, the impact of urban farming, just the accessibility. Now that's now that's just food, you know, for example. But we can look not just at food resources. We can look at things like education, right? We can look at the disproportionate levels of quality of education, of healthcare. Um, the second thing outside of, you know, heightening awareness is understanding, and this is a try on for many people, that someone else's experience and belief doesn't have to be proven, doesn't have to be proven. The client doesn't have to prove to you that what they're experiencing or what they believe is true, right? It's our job to help us understand their experience, not for us to prove to them that their experience was correct, was right. And that's, you know, again, we'll have some examples and videos and things like that. But it's so important that when we, we walk through oppression, that we're really walking through it with the people who are most impacted that feel it themselves. Whatever that uh, that other is, right, that we're saying, no, what is it like for you? And but what and, and not again, we get into sometimes like trying to refute it. Well, it's not that bad. Right. Uh, it doesn't happen all the time. Um, well, what about that last time? And it's not really our job to dispute whether these things are the way that they are, even if it really does sound um, like a catastrophe. You know, there are usefulnesses, right, of catastrophe. And some of those things are navigating those fears. I always ask my clients, um, tell me the worst case scenario. Tell me the worst case scenario. Now, people might go, well, you know, our job as a social worker is to get people to think more positively and have hope and instill something like that. But what I found is when you can navigate someone's worst case scenario, it can only get better, right? Now that we figured out answers and some solutions to the very worst case, more than likely, and this is where we have to come to, like I said, trying on, I, I tell them to try on the fact that the worst case scenario probably won't happen. It probably won't all happen. Some of it will happen, some of it won't. 
But the chances of 100% of all the worst case scenarios happening is minimal. But if we can move through some major parts of those worst case scenarios, we know we can handle the five, right? We can handle the three, we can handle the seven because we've already moved through the 10. Um, so it's really live allowing them to live that experience and belief and helping them process to maybe, even if they believe it, to like, well, what can you do about it? Because we're not going to prove or disprove you know, any individual necessarily. Uh, so we, we were navigating awareness. We're looking for patterns, right? Patterns of thought, patterns of how we are assessing the ways of discipline. Um, and again, and another point to uh, even in the American Psychological Association, how huge of a part, right, that education, the, edu the, the resources of education impacting children in early childhood and persistent throughout K to 12 grade. And like I said, this clinician um, was working with young boys, young black boys in a public school right here in Richmond. And some of the, that understanding of um, you're working, although you're in a clinical position in a school setting, that understanding that from pre-K and maybe even before pre-K, that these have been disparities that are, are that are there that you're also navigating, right? You're navigating oftentimes um, IEPs and um, people who have learning needs and language barriers and all sorts of things. And you're maybe coming in at fourth grade, but this has been going on for five or six grades. So we can't walk in and have the expectation that, and the assumption also, that every child is really having an equal access to education and quality education. And you don't know how much that impacts a child in terms of behavior, right? Uh, so I don't know how much people who are from a substance use background may have heard of this study called Rat Park. Um, if you have, great, because I'm going to ask you what your thoughts are about this. I did hear about Rat Park, but not from the perspective of substance use disorder. I was studying systemic oppression, and this was the example that they used to talk about oppression. Right. And what the study is, was back in the 50s and 60s, there was an experiment where the scientists took rats and um, put basically put them in cages and had them have access to um, opioids. Right. Um, opioid medication, morphine, and it was freely available to them in this sort of enclosed caged in space. What they found was that when they were caged in, that the rats would go and almost use until um, overdose, right? Till they made themselves sick or they would die early, the necrosis, all of those horrible things would happen. Um, what was important about being taught this from a systemic oppression point of view is that this is oftentimes the way that oppression works in terms of trauma and culture. We talked already about the lack of resources in terms of healthcare, medical, educational, just even having access to fresh fruits and vegetables. And so my my really, my idea of this is, this is really the cage. This is much, so much the cage of what so many people are currently experiencing because those limitations are cages. They really, you know, they really cause many individuals from becoming fully, right, the themselves. They cause trauma, right? They cause lack of access. Um, and this is without even talking about, right, just any active, right, acts of discrimination or oppression or violence. This is just not having access. Those just physical and actual cages that community, people in the community are moving through on a regular basis. Um, so, like I said, if you look at um, substance use treatment, Right. What they found in this study was once they changed the environment of the rats that and put them in their most natural environment. Right. They put, you know, trees and wood and things that um, they would like to play in and had them all come together. Right. They create a community for these rats that the use of morphine decreased significantly. Right. It decreased significantly just literally by lifting those barriers. 
And so what my hope is, is that once we start looking at things through a really cultural lens, that we can really see how not just working out in that macro micro level, but also, you know, macro level, that if we actually attend to the policy and to the environment of the individuals that we serve on that level, as well as on one-on-one -on -one relationship building, that we hopefully will reduce and improve the health well-being of many of the people that we serve in a more in a more effective way. Um, I'm going to have you watch, hopefully this plays, um, two videos. Uh, you're going to see a short video. This will be like two minutes. And then the next slide will be another video, two minutes. And then I'm going to ask you for your reactions around uh, what you're seeing on the screen. Let's see. So Clark, I wanted to talk to you about those kids you brought yesterday. But what about? Well, I was one of them, but you made some kind of mistake. Mistake? Yes, sir. What's your name, sir? Sam's. I'm the son. Oh, Sam's. Sam's. You're a freshman? Yes, sir. Cutting class and smoking crack, Mr. Sam's? No mistake. No, sir. It wasn't me, sir. I swear it wasn't. Wasn't you? No. You think I'm stupid, son? No, sir. Yes, you do. You're trying to con a con man. You're not even learning anything on the streets, are you? You come with me. What are you doing? It's okay. Let me tell you something. The trouble with being a teenager is you don't know nothing. The problem with teenagers is you think you're smarter than people who've already been down the road you're traveling. You know what I'm trying to say to you, boy? Do you? Yes, sir. Did you tell your father I threw you out of school? Look at me, damn it! No, sir. Why not? No gun, huh? Pray to what he's going to say to you, aren't you? My father doesn't live with us anymore, sir. Oh, is that what you're doing now? Go around feeling sorry for yourself, boy? Huh? Go on, get out of here. You're wasting my time. Please let me back, sir. <laughs> I have to get back in school. I can't go home and tell my mom I got kicked out of school. Now, why should I let you back into my school, Sams? Because I'm going to do better, sir. How? By doing my work. What else? It's staying out of trouble. What have you been thinking about all this time? Why should I believe you now? Because I changed my ways. I don't believe you, Sam. I don't think you've changed a thing. Go on, jump. No, I don't want to jump. Yes, you do. You smoke crack, don't you? You smoke crack, don't you? Look at me, boy. Don't you smoke crack. Yeah. Yes, sir. You know what that does to you? Huh? No, sir. It kills your brain cells, son. It kills your brain cells. Now, when you're destroying your brain cells, you're doing the same thing as killing yourself. You're destroying the floor. Now, I say, if you want to kill yourself, don't fuck around with it. Go on and do it expeditiously. Now, go on and jump. Jump. No. <laughs> okay. We're going to move to the second video. And then I don't want to kill myself, sir. <laughs> You're quite true about this, are you? Right? Come on. Wait, what am I gonna wear? I don't see. Remember? Lisa's bringing your costume. Right, I gotta wash my hair. No, there's no time. No time! There's never any time. I don't have time to study. I'll never get into this. Oh, hey, hey, just calm down. It's okay. You're right. It's okay. Everything will be okay. Yeah. I just need one of these pills. You mean you really are taking drugs? I need them. Jesse, give me those. I need them. Jesse, you can't sing tonight. I'm sorry. Jesse, Jesse. 
All right. Okay. So I just wanted to stop there and take any questions, um, thoughts, reactions, and responses um, in comparing those two scenarios around youth and uh, substance use. I guess people can unmute or if there's questions in the chat, uh, can let me know. Hi. Hi. Hi, this is, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry, not yeah, but um, lean on me. I think it's yes. more of, uh, it's like in the community, we say tough love. Definitely. So more, that was more of a quote unquote tough love opposed to with Jess, it was more, um, a little more sympathetic, a little more, um, you know, a little more nurturing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would definitely our, agree. Yeah, in our community, tough love is is sometimes how we see it to help those learn. Right, right, and I think the speaker uh, prior to our keynote today did a great job of talking about how the recommendation was tough love. Right, sometimes tough love is also associated with just him being a male. Right. And that um, a woman who is challenged with substances versus a male who's challenged with substances. It can also, like I said, you, you said be race and be cultural and, and all of those things tied into the sternness. Right. Of teaching and discipline and expectations. Um, anything else? Anything else that stood out for anyone around? How would you approach um, if you had both those um kids as clients, so they're both teenagers, what what differences and approaches would you would you use? Okay, here I am again. I would say I would want to know the why. You know, how how do we get here? Right, right. Because I'm sure they have definitely different experiences. Um and I want to point out, like I said, we have to always be heightening our awareness, right, of, of race and culture, that this is, media plays a huge part, obviously, in how we look at substance use and what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. Sympathy, like you mentioned, empathy, and with the, uh, the Jesse, right, uh, video, she talks about the pressure of high achievement. That has a lot to do with her use. And obviously she is a, a white female and, and that's seen as sometimes for many people more acceptable, more acceptable because she's, you know, she's really just trying to study to get into college. And I don't know, you know, again, I, I grew up in New York City and, and then moved into the suburbs. And I realized um, even in high school times how acceptable taking other people's ADHD medication was for people who were getting into Ivy League colleges, right? When I started going to a more of a predominantly white high school, um, did that make it a better? No, not, not actually, right? But it was definitely seen differently because the use was around achievement, right? And a lot of things that are centered around a more Eurocentric worldview, right? And that is one of the, the worldviews of being Eurocentric is, survival of the fittest, competition, right? Being the first to do something, a, a, excel in achievement. As if you look at a more, you know, maybe African-centered worldview, it is much more around collectivism, doing things together, achieving things together, being together, understanding, right? Being felt, being seen and being felt. So those are some of the ways that even looking at just like snippets of how media is even um, showing and displaying what substance use looks like. And even in layers of what we're more comfortable with versus what we're least comfortable with, like crack over opiates. And, and I talk about that, right? In the next slide. Um, and if anyone, next slide is that there's definitely a difference and we see um, behavioral change, um, 
the way that we look at psychedelics, right? The way that we look at it in the 70s and versus how we in a legalization of marijuana. Um, the post Vietnam War, you know, epidemic with heroin, right? And I grew up, like I said, in the city in the 1980s. This was a huge part, right? Is this sort of idea of this crack epidemic and crack babies and, and how we see drugs differently, talk, talked about differently in communities of color versus out of color. Like this said earlier, where he was, you know, growing up, right? And going to high school, there were so many people taking out the right now we were years, right that was an epidemic but we didn't hear about it in the same way that we heard about crack epidemic right and the crack epidemic was really centralized around black and brown um communities and so just heightening our awareness about that is how disparities and right and ways of thinking in different ways of assessing and treating can create those sorts of spaces yeah, so we talk about we talked about the differences and what those videos kind of cause us to see. They should cause a different reaction, even though we're still talking about substance use and all those things. It it's going to create something in us where hopefully we become more aware that yeah, I am seeing these two it's teenagers very differently. Their motivations to use very differently. Their family situations very differently. The culture, right, and the even some of the um, historical oppression factors and current oppression factors in school and education very differently. And that should be part. Uh, that should play a part in your lens in terms of how you approach care, right, with individuals. But like we can see through history, right, if we look at this chart and some of the differences. Um, when we talk about behavior change and community change and things like that, um, there's always right been a bias as to how we look at substance use in different communities, right? Where it's black and brown communities in a crack epidemic, or maybe more rural America and opioid epidemics. Um, it, it definitely gave a sense of well, the people who have opioid addiction they got it from a doctor. And so they really need treatment and care. And this is a medical issue. Whereas the individuals and the communities that were black and brown, they're plagued with crack. And that's really a decision. And that's more of a value-based decision and a moral choice, right? That these people are choosing to make that's you know, damaging their community. It was both epidemics, but approached very differently depending on literally just the shade of your skin. So to bring in more awareness, right, we have to understand some power and privilege, right, and that um, it's not just race, and it's not just, you know, gender, it's, it can be things like ageism, it can be things like, I know, um, just being older, right, sometimes can have privileges, up until the time that you get to, to an age where you may need help, and then it's no longer as much as a, pri pri a privilege, um, yeah, and I think someone in the chat said, yeah, crack, the crack epidemic also was criminalized, right? As with the opioid epidemic was a medical crisis, right? It was pharmacy that people were over prescribing these painkillers that hadn't really been prescribed except for like severe situations. So we just even have different things, but you know, it, it, it was use, right? It was really substance use, Um and that's important, that's important to know. And it's important for us to look at sometimes um, this privilege because we don't even realize that even, even though I'm a woman of color, that I still can hold privilege, right? Because um, I was born in the US. That can be a privilege over someone who is not. Uh, if I identify as Christian, that can be a privilege over someone who is not, right? If you're fertile, if you've had children, are you able to have children? That is considered privilege, right? And so it's really important for us as we walk through clients of all these different walks of life that we're we're really centering us, well, not centering ourselves, but really centering the client and understanding there are going to be parts and pieces of flow that we just, we don't get, we don't, we don't understand, right? And I'm so glad, yes, 
to mention around around that epidemic, right, that you guys are mentioning, I'm so glad y'all pointing the, that out, is that cocaine was a lot more accept, acceptable, right, in the 80s and 90s than crack, right? Same substance, you know, differently, you know, curated, but cocaine was seen more of a privileged drug with people who were probably non-Black or not of color. And um, that was seen more acceptable. Even people at their workplaces perhaps using, right? People of a higher stature or wealthy year would use. Um, and so there's all sorts of ways that we really look at disparities and how we just simply you look at use. Is it still harming? Yeah. Is it still impacting families? Well, yeah, health, obviously. But the fact that we have kind of like looked at drugs all this time through a through a media gaze of it's not that bad. It's not criminally linked when it's not necessarily people of color or it's not people who don't have money, right? We can put these people in treatment. We need to put these other people in jail. So disparity plays a huge part in just approaching substance use. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Okay, so... This is where, this is one of those try on things. We talked about the 1950s and 60s in a science experiment called Rat Park. And basically I alluded to the fact that oppression large in part is technically our cages, right? The technically the cages that, that are real and they're not imagined. They're not, these are real cages where we have evidence that from school to housing to foods that there are limitations and the likelihood and the propensity of use are going to be higher. And someone asked me, and it was a businessman, um, is it you're not seeing any images? Yeah, I can see the image, but I don't know if everyone else can. I think Linda's sharing hers. Oh, okay, she can share it to me. So maybe it's a refresh of your screen. I think everyone else is seeing um, can you, the screen. Can you see, you mean the slides? Yeah, I can see the slide. It says addressing the cages that were, in, uh -huh. that were injected. Mm -hmm. So I can see that. Um, someone in the chat said they didn't see the the, the slide. Oh, so, um, I was like, maybe it's just a, oh. a screen refresh. But so in this in this slide, we we like I said, we're just revisiting the graphic of the rat park, and we're talking about how we can change our language and empathy around, um, really around bias and oppression, and really looking at it from all the different dynamics I learned with the. Uh, credit, right? Some of them are teachers, Baba Wakesa and Mama Fia, they run I Institute, and then also so many other great African-centered teachers that talk about this, this idea called injected oppression. Sometimes, just like how we criminalized crack cocaine, we often use the term internalized racism. And that means the person who's being, right, a victim of racism is choosing to put racism into their life, into their behavior. They're making choices, right? They have all the control in the world to, because if you can internalize something, you can what? Externalize it, right? You're making a decision to internalize it. So I start replacing that kind of language from internalized racism to injected oppression, right? And you can see the slides with the rats where they're actually injecting and those sorts of things. Because oftentimes it is injected. We can't control 100% of our environment. We can't control the political climate. We can't control 100% violence, um, resources, wealth, right? There's disparities of health. We can't control which doctors we get. If we can get a doctor that looks like us and speaks like us or a, a therapist is also uh, one of those things where people are always asking, can I, can I find someone who can understand me? We, we can't even guarantee that we can have, uh, that we need to be conscious, right? Of how many people don't speak English, right? And can they get a therapist that can relate to them in their native language? There's all sorts, right, of ways that this oppression is injected in us. And people will say, well, then what do we do about it? Well, we remain aware and we do the work to change that. We do the work to increase the diversity in fields of health and in fields of education. We do our best to educate 
you know, individuals around the bias, whether it be implicit or just, you know, explicit bias, that we need to make a, a real call to action around these systems and these people and this diversity needs to be here if we really hope to change the system in the communities that we serve. Um, but really, it's about being really human centered and understanding and appreciating that all humans are centered and we want to increase their capacity, right? We want to increase their ability to cope and navigate. Um, and that's really what, what our jobs are. Okay, we can move to the next slide. Uh, yeah, so, so this is another example, right, of that, of that oppression bias. When we talked about, I talked about the crack epidemic, and, I, and if you're familiar, right, if you watched some movies or you were in a time, like you lived in a time of the 80s, you've heard the expression crack epidemic and definitely heard uh, the expression crack babies, which was used pretty pretty often um in fact that when i was a kid that was a name that they called you in my in my neighborhood if you act strange you call you a crack baby um i grew up in harlem part of most of my young life so they actually had a a hell house where they had children who were taken from their mothers and um an older woman would take care of all of these children and they would have like news shows and show all these babies that were quote unquote crack babies that were going to have what we believe to be lifelong, right, um, disabilities or impairments because their mothers use crack while they were while they were pregnant with them. Well, in 2009, right, what we learned is that wasn't even that that wasn't even the issue, right? That 20 years later in research, the children that were exposed to crack actually didn't suffer any long-term effects. Um, they're relatively low, you know, issues as far as, far as child brain functioning. Um, definitely cocaine is bad, drugs are bad. But when you compared it to alcohol and tobacco, which were two legal substances, there were far worse implications. And that is what we need to really focus on bias and oppression. What is really the truth versus what our media says um, is, is something that we need to focus on. It's not to say like, like, hey, don't pay attention to the mom who's pregnant, who's um, using crack cocaine or cocaine. It's to say, really, let's really put the research back into it. So for you got to think about all the trauma. These, these are the kids that we started seeing when I started doing my work uh, in 2004, got licensed in 2009. This was a whole idea that these were these were crack babies and um, these were the babies of the kids and and they were going to have behavioral issues. So even in like therapists and social workers views. This led to how we serve really accurate. Granted. The. the, the, the so let me know if you can hear me. Okay. Can everybody hear me now? Sure. Linda, you can let me know if I can still be her. Okay. Okay. Wi Fi is wonky again. Okay, it's choppy. Well, we'll just wait a second. Maybe it'll, I don't know what else I can do. Okay, it's back. Okay, so we'll try to go as long as we can. I apologize. There's nothing I'm touching. So we may not get through all the slides, but I'll be sure to stop and allow uh, any questions, observations uh, in the next few minutes. So uh, great, we're back. So so like I was saying, because, you know, we had this preconceived notion about what a crack baby was, and these moms and they were using drugs and all of these things, it came into not just social workers, by the way, teachers, principals, uh, police officers, probation officers, right? Thinking about these kids as they developed and grow, thinking about how many times <clears throat> those little boys and little girls were referred to um, special education services, and um, taken into foster care, right? And you think about it, like if research says having tobacco and alcohol 
is way more severe, but you're taking children into care because of <clears throat> because of cocaine exposure, that we can think about how that bias and that disparity plays out for communities of color oftentimes, is even though a substance is more um, dangerous, right, and harmful, we won't, we won't, no one's being taken into care, right, foster care, because their mom smoked or because necessarily their mom drank, right? But they are being taken into care because they use substances, wherein we could change all that. We could just give the moms recovery services, right? We could definitely work and work around the substance use disorder the same way they did with the opiate use disorder. So it's important for us to note that. Um, we go to the next slide. Um, and so I, I point to the trauma that, oh, it was a slide before that. I point back to the, the trauma that um, that we have, right? Is a lot, I think this was the one after this, the slide after that. The trauma that we had is, you know, you have to ask yourself important questions. Like how many of them were re referred for special education services? How many of those children were taken out of their home and taken away from their family of origin because their mom used a substance during their pregnancy? How much does that impact the work that we're doing? Not even, we're not even treating children who have been exposed to substances. Now we're treating children that may have been exposed to trauma from false care system, from the educational system, from the healthcare system itself. And so now that becomes even in our, our micro view and even in our macro view of how we look at bias and its impacts to treatment. Um, so through this lens, right, we can see that there's been unspeakable harm, right? And that's even more of a reason that we need to embrace really a culturally affirmative system and really start practicing, really start being aware and holding our consciousness that it, at moments and at times when we're navigating emotion and need and trauma, that this is still very much uh, a systemic issue and it's uh, a macro issue and a policy issue and a one-on-one -on -one resource issue and so many, so many um, issues where, like I said, it's, it is it is injected and right. And how do we treat that? And how do we, how do we stop those, that injection? Uh, changing the narrative for clients and clinicians, right? Uh, what I do is work around, you know, co-creating treatment that address resiliency, identifying internal and external strengths, right? Um, the role of extended family is one of the things we point to oftentimes, creating community. Um, it's it's not, it's, it's so evident, right? That even if we talk about animals and that example of the rat park, they, the, those uh, animals fared way better when they were in community with other people who could relate, who could play, who could interact, right? Their use was so much less. And think about just in the last few years, how often uh, it is has become difficult to access care. How often do we get calls where we have more calls than workers to work those cases, or we need to look for someone to hire to service um, this population, or we have to get a Spanish speaking um, individual to work with these families that have been on the waiting list for forever, because it's just not something that we proactively think about in terms of our collective community engagement. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Okay, and so some of the things um, as I do this consultation work, um, I always say we really like to look at creative solutions. Um, it's not just about, you know, saying, wow, there's just despair and there's this bias and there are oppression, there's racism. Yes. Um, and there's ways that we need to advocate, right? We're, this is not a just feel bad. This is really go out there in the ways that make sense. And so when I'm working with individuals and professionals and organizations, it is around closing some of those barriers, closing some of those gaps addressing them, you know, really head on. You know, there's communities, I've talked about communities of color, but even in rural communities, right? Southwest Virginia, where like for some, there there is no therapist, there is no psychiatrist, right? That we need to think proactively, like satellite offices, you know, um, engaging in locations, offering office space, right? I can't tell you the amount of clinicians that are starting out 
uh, as professionals. They want to do private practice. They want to engage, but the fees, right? The access to offices and paying for offices when they haven't quite built their clientele to um, be able to have the revenue to pay for the offices becomes a huge barrier, right? Medicaid, transportation, transportation in general, transportation and housing, still a huge issue. And people will separate that oftentimes from treatment for mental health and substance use. However, it can't be separated because we know that some people who even are court mandated to take the courses or take the classes, if they can't get to the treatment courses or classes, then what? Right. And so working out and what, what I've done with one program is talk about working out um, contracts, you know, with um, Medicaid transportation providers around getting people to IOP level of care, partial level of care, transportation companies, um, accessing funding, because we know that's a huge barrier for many people is simply transportation, because we don't have providers in every, let's say, 15 square square mile, right? Um, also having things like hybrid, hybrid programs where they're virtual and they're in person and they're accessible, but just is generally increasing accessibility. So I thought to myself, you know, if we know that we have this huge adolescent substance use issue, why don't we have treatment in schools? Why don't we have substance use disorder treatment in schools? Now, there, there are, right, preventive services, and I'm sure there are within the state, a couple of programs. But we know that this, this um, issue is in every school, right? Every high school, middle school, we have identified this as being um, a, an issue that is not likely to go away anytime soon. Yet, we don't have a treatment facility, a place, a room, an office in every county. And we have to start asking ourselves creatively, why is that? If we know we have a problem and we know we can serve client, clients and, and adolescents in places that they have to naturally go every day, why aren't we going into their natural habitat and working with them there versus asking them to come to our environment and working with us where we are? Another example of this is the huge, like I said, the health disparity around we talked about um, having uh, no access to food, food deserts. And we also know we have a healthcare crisis in terms of especially older adults, older individuals, communities of color. What if we just placed our farmer's markets where our doctor's offices were? Like, why don't we just think creatively, right? About just simply increasing the access and the, the multi-useness, right? Of some of the basic needs that we know um, evidence based wise is going to deeply impact the health care and well being of the individuals that we serve. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Okay, so like I said, we talked about you know some of the those access issues and continuing care. One of the hugest barriers that you know remain is obviously access, not having enough, but then just really doing the work around coordination and stepping down and stepping up and being like, it's yeah, creative, right? I say, hey, they, we have social work interns that need internships all the time. We have we have a need, uh, you know, we have a need for licensed mental health clinicians. Um, I work with the Boost Program, which helps to get 200 um, clinicians licensed in the state of Virginia to do their supervision work, right? But then there's also a need with substance use disorder, but people don't feel as comfortable um, working in fields, especially with children. And why not make, why not incentivize, right? Those, those individuals who are interested and have a desire to explore and work in those fields. Uh, we have universe, some of the best universities here in the state. And that means we have a wealth of knowledge right in our backyard, like right up the street, BCU, Virginia State, Virginia Union, Virginia Tech, like we we have oftentimes everything we need. We are literally not being that little red piece of the puzzle where we're connecting those things together. And I think that's what my charge for you guys is, is to really start looking at some of these ways that we've explored bias and the ways that we can continue to sort of, you know, bridge those gaps. Okay, we can move to the next slide. 
Okay, so one of the ways, I'm also licensed in Maryland, one of the ways that um, that's done is through uh, implicit bias training that is uh, mandatory for all licensed clinicians. Um, I definitely think we need that here in Virginia as a requirement of our continuing education. Um, we, you know, it is a very complex unconscious issues around attitudes, reactions, and stereotypes, just from the videos that we saw, saw already, right, that we we fully understand that there is just differences in the way that we're viewing things and that that we definitely need some ongoing support and training around. Um, OK, next slide. And I'm going to be sliding through these a little fast, but I may stop and just take some questions if you have some. Um, I will play. Oh, I don't know if we can play this. So maybe we I don't know if we can. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Um, Did you think you could beat it? I know I can beat it. You know it. Very confident. I'm very confident. Say it so easily. Why? Because I believe it. And let me tell you why. What she has said, she said it with so much confidence the first time. But if you keep going on and on. But so we can't keep it interrupting. I mean, if you want. You've got to understand that you're dealing with an image of a 14 year old child. And this child gonna be out there playing when your old ass and me gonna be in the grave. When she says something, we done told you what's happening. You do it with a little black kid and let her be a kid. She done answered it with a lot of confidence. Leave that alone. What do you feel inside when you're on the court? I feel good. I feel good. Okay. Um, it is 12 o'clock, so we're gonna go ahead and start stop there and talk about what your feelings star around that last video what are the things that you saw like did anybody notice that the reporter like did anything wrong why do you think that is um uh what venus uh the tennis player and that was her father uh did you notice why her father was so upset yes sure speak on it because if she had been a little white prodigy, no one would have questioned her confidence, like, at all. And we're supposed to be small and make other people comfortable around our success. We're supposed to be self-deprecating. We're supposed to be the type of people who are just like, oh, you know, maybe I right. might, you know, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. And for her, at her, especially at her age, to have that confidence, it kind of threw the reporter off. And so he kept asking the question. And I think her dad was just right. like, enough of that. Like, my daughter is the best of the best, and you're going to treat her like she's the best. So Absolutely. that was my takeaway. Absolutely. He doubted. He Remember when we talked about bias, is a lot to do with navigating bias is we question. We don't realize it, but we question other people's lived experience and beliefs Right. And I said, the first thing we got to start doing is going with what people believe and not questioning their lived experience because it is theirs. And I can't tell you what it's like to be a man. I can't tell you what it's like to be this. I can't. But we need to really believe. So one of the things um, that is that is how oppression works is that you take the image of what you believe about yourself. And then someone says, nope, I'm going to start creating doubt. You can't do that. That's not right. Uh, crack is bad. Cocaine is good, right? You're a crackhead. You're you're a crack baby. You're you're poor. You're broke. It starts there, right? It doesn't necessarily start there, but that's a huge part of it. It's just simply believing in what you believe about yourself, right? And things being less than or other. And and he was attempting to do that. That's why his father, the father. Any other thoughts about the video you just saw or the presentation? Questions about bias or treatment. We we do have one in the chat um, from Tabitha, and she wrote, "And this type of questioning continues in the workplace with our clients and colleagues." Absolutely, that is absolutely true. Um, I I had an an occasion, right? I worked in uh, public health care, and I wanted to do a. I wanted to be promoted. And I was like, hey, you know, tell me what I need to do to be promoted. And the supervisor at the time was like, well, you need to just stop hanging around some of the people that you're hanging around. 
Now that had nothing to do education, um, how I worked with my clients, whatever. It's she felt like I had more personal relationships with people. And those people happen to be people who looked like me that were around my age. And that that was going to somehow dissuade or impact the um, profession or the promotion that I was going into or that I was hoping to go into. Um, and so we don't recognize, and I don't think I recognized it at the time, right, is that that had really nothing to do with whether I was qualified or not, right? If someone does a practice or is a certain, or they're in a personal relationship, it has nothing to do with it. But oftentimes when it comes to work around bias and oppression, people have, like I said, some of this is implicit and some of it is not. And we don't always know, but we definitely know when it shows up because oftentimes it is injected. It is injected. Um, it is, and I hope that we're all working to not internalize, right? We, we're not gonna internalize, we're gonna look at it as being injected. And Jessica, you raised, Jessica, you raised your hand. Would you wanna say something? Thank you, Jessica. Jessica, I'm going to probably say your last name incorrectly. I'm sorry. Uh, Kagano? I see she's unmuted. She's on video. Okay. I guess probably, oh. You can probably stop sharing your screen and I, I can see ah. everyone else. There we go. Okay. Does that help? <laughs> sure. Jessica, did you All have right. a question? She might need to turn her computer volume on. Oh. Oh. Or you can even type it in the chat if you want. Now it looks like you're muted again. Okay, she'll put it in the chat. I think someone else had a question in the chat as well. Let's see? Okay, I'll, we'll just wait for you to put that in the chat, and I'll check the I'll check the meeting chat. Um, oh, is that how imposter syndrome can be born? Um, so I have kind of a different view about imposter syndrome um, when it comes to bias and culture. I know that a lot of people use, oh, well, that's imposter syndrome, imposter syndrome, imposter syndrome, because um, they may be a person of color, they may be a woman, or they may be in some other ways, not in the dominant culture. Um, but I think I, I stopped calling it other things. I just call it oppression. I call it injected oppression. I don't call it anything other than that. I don't call things microaggressions. There are no microaggressions. Everything is oppression, right? And oppression-based ways of thinking. Um, because sometimes the thing is, Language is very powerful, especially when you're talking about oppression. Just in that short clip, that 57 seconds with the reporter, all he did was ask the question over and over again. And even we felt the doubt that he was attempting to build. And that's why it's so important to use that language. Uh, that's oppression-based behavior. That's oppression thinking. That's injected oppression. So there is no imposter syndrome. You went to school. You got an education. You have a career. What's, what are you impostering? Now, you're not trying to be, you know, you're not trying to be a CPA. You went to school for this. So there's nothing to imposter. Um, that is more deeper work, right? That a lot of us, um, you know, who do this sort of work have to go through with people is, um, I had to stop using words like microaggression and, um, you know, little white anythings or whatever, whatever those language things are is like, no, this impacts people because um, even that microaggression, right? can lead to someone picking up the phone, calling the police and someone's life being lost. That's why it can never be micro. It can always be what it is. Okay. Um, I think we have some more questions. Okay. Yeah. So Jessica says from the video, it show how um, she continued with her confidence during and can, as he continues to question her, we are taught from a very young age to continue to stand our ground. That's a very important thing. Very, very important is we are often taught that no, this is what I believe, right? And that's why it's so important for us when we're looking at culture is to really get into the sense of like, what are your experiences? What are your beliefs? 
because that is really the core basis of how you're going to provide appropriate and effective treatment is really believing them. It's the most powerful thing you can do with someone that you're serving is simply to believe them. Um, Cause it never explain, experienced as a uh, micro to be harmed, um, to those harms, right. To those victims, um, people thought calling 911 when they heard loud whatever things and they didn't know what was going on was okay. And now, you know, hopefully we all know that it's very much not okay. It's very much not okay. And even in, even inside of families of color, we really have to do work, right? And not calling 911 for everything, to learning how to resolve conflict, to learning how to take time apart and time away, right? So just because it's, um you know, a different culture, different race, even within culture and within race, we have to say, let's, let's not criminalize conflict. Let's not criminalize lies each other let's not well, I like to use the expression uh, let's not throw each other away we can, can understand and not agree we can understand but we don't have to agree and we don't have to agree today we may not we may also understand where each other's coming from um so super important uh, being confident is very powerful. Sometimes others are threatened by this. Absolutely, absolutely, and um, and that's why I said I don't I don't use words like imposter syndrome, because walking in your strength and walking in your authentic self every day, especially as a person of color, as a, a, a woman, a, a whatever doesn't fit into like I said that Eurocentric uh, place, is oftentimes the most powerful thing you can do. That's the most powerful. It's just to be authentically who you are for where you are and not have people tell you you have to work to be something other than who you are. Um, you can decide when you want more. You can decide if you want another decree. You can decide if you want, you know, whatever more that you want. You can decide and you can also decide that's enough and you can decide to rest and you can make that decision very powerfully and saying, OK, I'm ready to, to rest. But what I found is like with clients, when you tell them and you remind them to identify with their own strength, they are more likely to do their own work. It no longer becomes me trying to get you to stop doing something or start doing something. It becomes, I'm supporting you on what you want to do, right? I'm understanding where you're coming from. I understand that we don't even have solutions for some of the things that you need. We don't have the access that you need. And that's not your fault. That's our fault. That's as a community, that's our fault. We know that this is a problem. Why don't we have programs in school? We have funding when it comes to, like I said, that criminalization part, but the proactive things, not so much. And we can do a better job around that. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? These are all good. I have a so of a statement um, regarding the um, disputing disparities. I mean, uh, yeah, disparities or minimizing disparities. You touched on earlier, mm -hmm. um, and prior to becoming a uh, become prior to becoming a licensed mental health practitioner, I had an opportunity to be equal opportunity in the military. And one thing I quickly learned is that my perception is my reality. So when we mm -hmm. start. Uh, minimizing or disputing disparities, the first thing is we're not validating that individual, you know, validating how they either feel or how they view their life. So, I, you know, I say sometimes that we are very quick to kind of minimize, you know, it's, it's really not that bad. But at the same time, when we do that, we're not validating, you know, and that's just how the person happens to see his or her life. Right. Absolutely. And uh, um, one of the things we I work around with um that worked around with Aya and um Kiboli Boli, some African-centered work is really around being authentic with our emotions. Um telling women, right, like for example, that it's okay to be angry. Right. It is okay to own anger. And especially women who um are, are faith, this becomes a huge conflict because they've been told gentleness right? Kindness, turn the other cheek, be enduring, right? And oftentimes this can lead into those 
substance use, drinking, um, substituting, right? We actually have a term called substituting emotions where we trade out, we talk, we, we express, right? So I'm upset with my spouse. And so instead of really being angry, which is the mad, right, that I'm feeling, I'll substitute it, right? I'll substitute it with, um, maybe I'll substitute it with sad, or maybe I'll substitute it with joy because, you know, a woman has to really always be joyful, happy, you know, like easy to get along with, you know, not causing too much conflict. But we substitute emotions all the time because we we honestly because we live in a world of oppression and we have to do sometimes that's conscious and we have to do the things that will help us to survive and thrive. And that's OK, because, you know, it's very conscious. I'm doing this because I need to get home safe. This police officer stopped me and I, I am going to be this way. Right. But and that's when you know. But what happens over times that you don't know that you're substituting, that you don't, that you're not able to really be fully authentic in yourself? And what are you using to sacrifice? I mean, to substitute emotions, substance, cigarettes, uh, uh, food, all the other things. Right? It's not just about. And I always have to say that I wish it was just as simple as stop using drugs. And oftentimes it is so much more complex to how do I love myself? How do I live an authentic life? How do I get to know myself in an authentic way? And how am I going to express that in life? Um, and those are just, those are bigger treatment issues. Great questions, guys. Toxic relationships. Yes, toxic relationships. We see that over and over and over again, over and over and over again. Um, parenting, right, styles. Uh, I always tell uh, clients, especially my supervisees, right? Don't romanticize the parenting that our clients talk to us about. If it was not what it needed to be for their compassion, love, and empathy, you need to say that. Now, I always say our parents did the best that they could do, right? They gave us what they could, but sometimes they didn't have the thing to give to us that we really needed the most. But that's authentic. That's not being happy. That That's not putting a happy spin. And so sometimes, especially with new therapists, we want our, our clients to be happy, see the brighter side. And we that's not important. It's not important that they're happy. It's important that they are authentic about what is true for them, right? And they don't need to romanticize it, sugarcoat it, and nor, nor do we, right? It's It's gotta be a true strength. And oftentimes we can identify strengths, even when our parents did something that maybe wasn't for us, we can identify the why they did it, right? Like the speaker was talking before, like there was a why, right? I wanted you to have these things. I wanted you to be safe. I didn't want you to get hurt. I didn't want you to go out there and be whatever, still hurt. But the strength was that they cared enough to think why. Now, how they went about it, maybe not the best, right? Maybe diminished us in some way. But we, again, part of that, like, what we call duodenal thinking, both things can be true. It, it wasn't very effective and it wasn't very kind. And I did it because I really was afraid. So we don't have time to get into the, the feelings as messengers, but one of the big things that we know that from about oppression is most times when we talk about ejected oppression, it is centered around fear. It is centered around fear and trying to work and activate um, and live in a very fearful space. And that's what causes us to have to fake, pretend, not be authentic because we are afraid of things that are going to happen. Lack, grief, loss, um, lack of resources, lack of so community, lack of support. So it's really very much centered on fear. So a lot of my work is around getting people, like I said, worst case scenario, tell me the worst case scenario, is to really talk with them about their deepest fears. Because if we can do the worst case scenario, right? It's all up from there. So great. All these are great questions. I don't see any, any others. Thank you guys so much for participating in this Wi-Fi Challenges 3000. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Uh, if you would like to reach out or get in touch with me, you can at, um, at kwashingtonlcsw at gmail.com. 
also my website, Real Healing Center, R-E-A-L, Healing Center. Um, and um, if you have any questions or kind of follow up, this is going to be recorded and going to be on the uh, the website or the sorry, YouTube page. So hopefully once they edit out all those things out, you'll have some of this presentation. Um, yeah, so the slides will be in the presentation as well. I don't think I have made them shareable uh, just for the video. So the things on the video primarily. Um, so yeah, and so if any other kind of conversations, uh, oh yeah, let me put that in the chat. Good idea. Good idea, yeah. Ms. Washington, are you uh, currently taking on new individuals with supervision? Uh, I'm not familiar with the person, but a family member reached out to me who has a colleague that's looking for supervision for LCSW. Yeah, absolutely. I currently have a cohort of six, but I'm going to be starting the second cohort in 2024. So yeah, just reach out to me. And um, I'm also licensed in uh, for supervision for Virginia and Maryland. So I have someone getting ready to um, take her licensure exam. So perfect timing. Did I send that to everyone? I did not send it to everyone. I'm going to send my contact information to everyone at the top. And uh, CSW at gmail.com. And then my website. You can also reach out to me there. Okay. I'll share your email with the individual then. Thank okay, you. great. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for your participation and patience as well. Uh, and great questions. Awesome.